What's up, wrestling fans? Welcome to another pay-per-view point edition of the Smack Talk podcast presented by SmartOutMoment.com. This is the WWE No Mercy 2016 post-show where I'm going to be recapping my thoughts on the event, giving you my opinions of what just transpired a little bit ago. Talking Smack just ended. Needed to give myself a little bit of buffer time to check to see if there would be any interesting things happening there. And, of course, there wasn't, but (laughs) uh, before we get started, I just need to reintroduce you to who I am. If you are unaware, I am your host, Tony Mango, and once again, I'm going solo for this because, as I mentioned before, this brand split has killed a lot of people's interest in watching these type of shows, so I seem to be one of the only people that actually wants to watch them nowadays, which is kind of a shame for WWE, and I think the reason why a lot of that's happening is because a lot of these shows aren't necessarily seeming like they should have been can't-miss things afterward. Now, I'm going to have some issues with some of the different things that we're going to talk about tonight, and I want to preface this by reminding everybody that I had a hell of a lot of fun with Clash of Champions. That was an event where I ended up praising even Nia Jax and Sheamus of all people. But, for No Mercy, there were some major problems with this. And some good things, mind you. I'm going to break down both of them without doing what most people do, which is to make some judgment call that this is the best pay-per-view ever or the worst pay-per-view ever or anything that's crazy on the extreme levels like that. But I'm sure there's going to be people out there that will ignore the positives I'm going to bring up and will complain and say that I never like anything. And if that's what you do, well, you're an idiot. What can I say? (laughs) But now that we got that out of the way, we unfortunately do have to start with some negatives. Again, trust me, the thumbs up are coming, but I need to go on a rant first. The first thing that we had for this event was, of course, the kickoff. And the first thing that happened there was Kurt Hawkins coming out. Now, ahead of time, he had announced that he was going to step into the ring. And I made a joke, and I mentioned this on a Bleacher Report post, that they were going to literally make him step in the ring, and that was going to be it, because they hadn't announced any kind of a match that he was going to have, even though it really would have been a more advantageous thing for him to go up against somebody like an Apollo Crews. So what ends up happening? He comes out with shitty music, steps into the ring. He's still carrying that dumbass cane that he had before. And he says, wait until Tuesday. So that was our big uh, whole thing that we've been leading up to with Kurt Hawkins was you guys, I'm going to have a big announcement on Tuesday, and the big announcement on Tuesday is check me out at the pay-per-view, and the big pay-per-view announcement is check me out on Tuesday. And you know what? I normally wouldn't care too much because there's a part of me that loves that kind of troll thing and thinks that that kind of stuff is funny. And I also don't really care about Kurt Hawkins, but see, that's the issue. I don't care about Kurt Hawkins. So if you're going to do this delayed gratification thing, I don't see any payoff coming up that's worth this sort of stalling and dragging it out. Kurt Hawkins literally could have come back to the main roster the night that he signed the contract, and he could have lost every match for the next five years, and it wouldn't be either shocking or worth a damn, really. But if you're going to build him up to be something that we should wait for and we should anticipate, then he should actually be something worth anticipating. And I highly doubt that Kurt Hawkins is going to pull that off. Kurt Hawkins is decent in the ring. I'll give him credit. He's somebody who could have some potential in the tag team division and stuff. But looking back on his career, he's never really been all that much worth the while. His tag team endeavors have been primarily shitty. I mean, they had that gate crashers thing with Vance Vance Archer. Is that what it is? Yeah. Uh, That was horrible and then he had some other things here and there and I can't even remember who he necessarily tagged up with I think he tagged up with Tremperetta for a little bit maybe or maybe it was the Kalen Croft guy I, he might have been with Tyler Rex um yeah it was Tyler Rex yeah he did the whole uh Chippendales kind of gimmick or something where they did nothing but appear on main events uh superstars for like three years Kurt Hawkins is a guy that if you put him in the ring he can wrestle a decent match But if you trust that he's going to have any charisma and he's going to have any personality and any kind of character, he doesn't pull it off. And this whole gimmick is revolving around somebody having to be entertaining enough without getting in the ring. Eva Marie is able to do her shtick and still get a lot of criticism, by the way, just because it's built around her appearance and how ridiculously hot she is. 
Kurt Hawkins isn't playing a character of being ridiculously gorgeous woman and that kind of a thing. He's playing the part of just a douchebag, and he's not even a douchebag that's fun to watch like The Miz. He's just dumb to watch. The uh, Chuck Norris jokes are, what, 10 years too old to be relevant, and they're going to keep doing that kind of shtick? And the big payoff is just wait another fucking couple days? This doesn't make me want to watch SmackDown. This makes me think that SmackDown is only used to build up the pay-per-views, and the pay-per-views are only built up to tell me to watch SmackDown. And this kind of revolving, cyclical nature that WWE has, it works only when everything is good. When everything is bad and it's setting it up, it's setting up more bad stuff. So I can understand when people don't watch SmackDown because they go, well, the pay-per-view told me to just watch SmackDown, and the uh, SmackDown told me to watch the pay-per-view. And all I got in the ring was Kurt Hawkins being a pain in the ass. So that's not a good way to start off the event. Even worse, though, and this is where that rant becomes less of, oh, I didn't like it, and more of, there's a problem. They follow it up immediately with the announcement that Becky Lynch has been taken off the card, and they their way to, like, sort of... Uh, ease the pain, I guess you could say, is to say, but don't worry, you'll get that title match, Alexa, on November 8th in Glasgow, Scotland. Really? This is the second pay-per-view in a row for the SmackDown brand. Two for two, where they haven't paid enough attention to an injury, and then they've canceled it during the pay-per-view. Now, I know that we've announced... We, when we didn't announce, and they didn't announce either, but there were rumors floating around last night that this was going to end up happening. So I guess you t- kind of can't say that they waited until the last minute, but that almost is the last minute. And they didn't pull this from the card. They didn't put anything up on the website, nothing like that. They waited until you were actually watching the pre-show to announce it. And that speaks to a bigger issue, which is why don't they know what's going on with these injuries? If Randy Orton was injured enough that he couldn't take bumps, but they could still have him interfere with the Bray Wyatt match, and then wrestle, I think that next week on SmackDown, he should have been wrestling on the pay-per-view. And if Becky Lynch right now is doing what they're very, very specifically referring to as an uh, injury unrelated to in-ring action, that's a problem. There shouldn't be instances where injuries can pop up at the last minute like that that they don't know and then that they also don't have a good backup plan for. Now, the backup plan for this was the second-to-last thing on the card, and it was Alexa Bliss coming out and saying, there's nobody that can end up fighting me, there's no other contenders and all that, and surprise, surprise, her big challenger was Naomi, the only other babyface woman on the roster. The most predictable thing they could have possibly done And it's not good enough to go around the idea of this supposed title match that we were supposed to have. Now, I mentioned this in the Bleacher Report article that I wrote, which if you want to check that out, go ahead and check that out. Links are all over the place. Standard kind of things. But the way that I worded it is the best way that I can continue wording it, which is you don't advertise filet mignon on your menu and then serve White Castle burgers and expect people to not think that that's a shitty replacement. Naomi is talented, Alexa Bliss is talented, Becky Lynch is talented, and as much as I really wasn't so, so looking forward to that title match in comparison to something like, um, you know, if they were to cancel the Royal Rumble match, it's certainly not on that regard, but if you're going to tell me that the two supposed top best in that whole roster as far as the women's division go, and they're going to be fighting in a title match, And at the last minute you go, yeah, nah, how about like uh, Naomi? Not good enough. So you start off the night with Kurt Hawkins wasting time and saying, nah, just wait again. Tuesday's more important. And then you go, yeah, and by the way, we didn't know what's going on with Becky, but we'll give you a different match instead. But don't worry, a month from now you'll be able to get the title match. That is shitty. And that is poor planning on WWE's part because I can guarantee there's nothing going on with Becky Lynch that is so bad that they couldn't have caught this ahead of time if they would have paid more attention. Now, maybe they didn't pay any attention, and that's why they didn't catch it ahead of time, and that's poor planning on just checking up the health for everybody, because they should be watching people, monitoring their health, 
and all that to know whether there was some kind of an issue with Becky Lynch Tuesday and they should have been able to announce something that was different, some kind of a change on SmackDown. Because even though I'm not falling under this category, there's probably some people that the only reason they wanted to watch this card was for that Becky Lynch versus Alexa Bliss match. And then they had the Naomi match in uh, as like a replacement. And worse off even than that is I mean, actually I shouldn't say worse off because that's that's you know giving a little bit too much uh, hatred for what it deserves to be. But something else that's just a little bit bothersome, and this is something that happens when you you when you analyze WWE for a long time and you you try to look at things from that quote-unquote insider's perspective and the stuff like what we do here, as opposed to just from a fan's perspective, when Naomi wins the match against Naomi, uh, Alex Bliss, it's for two reasons. Number one, it's for shock value, because you would assume that Alexa Bliss would then win the match, and wouldn't it be shocking, and the, the audience would be surprised and whatever if we flipped the script? And second, it's because that sets up an intermittent feud to eat up some time until November 8th. So we know where they're going with this, and I can't even argue and say that I wouldn't have made that call myself. But it all just basically boils down to another means to stall, and rematches, and replacement things that don't equate to what they really should be doing. They said before this brand split that the reason why they wanted to do it is because they had a surplus of talent and that they wanted to drag storylines out more. Well, they didn't say drag storylines out more, but they said it would allow us more time to tell our stories without rushing. Well, it's translating to dragging the storylines out, and it's doing exactly what I said ahead of time, which was causing these injuries, and they literally don't have that surplus talent to be able to book around the injuries. So that's why we're getting these people that spend three weeks, two months, five months, whatever the case may be, and then they don't know what to do with it because they don't have an extra 10 people on the roster, an extra 20 people on the roster to be able to have some flexibility behind it. So now what we're going to get is, for the second pay-per-view in a row, we didn't get a match that was previously scheduled, and our replacement is going to be Alexa Bliss versus Naomi for the next six weeks, and of course they're going to pepper in some quote-unquote different matches where it's going to be Alexa Bliss and Carmella against Naomi and Nikki Bella. Oh my god, tag team matches, playa. And that's all we're going to see until Becky Lynch comes back from whatever injuries they're hiding. I don't know why they're really being like so mum on the word about that. That's going to end up being uh, close to November, unless it's even worse than a situation like that, which we can only hope is not the case. And then they'll eventually do that Alexa Bliss match. And by that time, I don't want to see Alexa Bliss versus Becky Lynch anymore because I, if I was going to see it, I wanted to see it when we were supposed to be building up to it. So that's kind of bothersome. And then our kickoff finally has a match, and it's an eight-man tag team match, which just proves that they don't know what they're doing with the tag team division either because we've seen this or a six-man tag or a ten-man tag, I think, every single week since the brand split. I don't remember a week where we haven't seen this, and maybe there's one week or two weeks where we haven't, but I know that we've been seeing it far too often for it to be worth a damn. This is basically just filler, and of course, I'd rather see some filler like this than to see some filler where we're getting, uh, you know, a, a KFC commercial again or something like that, but just because you can use the argument that it could be worse doesn't mean that this is good. That's never an argument that you should use. Yeah, if I lost an arm but I kept my other arm, it could be worse and I could lose two arms. Still not going to be talking about a good day that I had if I lost an arm, you know what I mean? So the eight-man tag team match was fine for filler, but it wasn't good. And it didn't have any stakes on the line, and it doesn't mean anything. And we've seen it before, and we've seen variations of it before, and we've seen that this is going to be the case going forward. We're going to continue to see these variations. So what's going to be next month? We're going to get an eight-man tag team match where American Alpha is going to get a title shot and in their replacement, it's going to be Heath Slater and Rhino. Ooh, really excited for that. So, take a deep breath. <sighs> that gets out a lot of the negatives that I have to say. Now let's start getting into some of the positives. And, of course, I'm going to go back to some negatives too, but you know, I do want to talk about some of the positive things here, and that's... One thing is the World Championship match. The triple threat that we had, which for some reason started off the show, I'm assuming that's because they were just petrified about that debate 
which at this point, if you don't know who you're voting for between Hillary Clinton and uh, Donald Trump, or you're like me who hates both of them and thinks that there's no point in voting whatsoever, then probably the debate's not going to matter to you, but I would assume that most people are going to watch that over something like No Mercy. So I kind of understand why they were doing that, but at the same time, it's a little bit weird that they would book that for the first match of the night. Either way, really, really good match. Second best match of the night. And that's not to say that it's second best because uh, it was something in any kind of bad regard. It's just, it was really, really good. And there was one other match that was just a little bit better than that. So kudos to these three for being able to pull off a great, great match. We had a lot of good things that were on the booking side of this that I really, really loved a lot. Like the double tap out, which this is a good means to talk about how do you properly book three people to end up coming out looking like winners where you for, I guess, like, the technical definition of the match, shouldn't only have one winner out of the whole bunch. We have AJ Styles tapping out to Dean Ambrose and John Cena at the same time, which gives both of them credibility to, therefore, in the future, say, I made you tap out, I deserve a title match. AJ Styles, of course, looks, like, a little bit on the weaker side. Champion, whenever he taps out, always looks a little bit weak. But since it's a two-on-one kind of a thing, Mike Kyoto isn't sure how do you really rule that, who gets the victory if technically kind of both of them ended up winning. So the match is called off. It's, you know, restarted, or I guess you should say continues because it never actually rang a bell. And after that, we get the flip side of it, where instead of Ambrose and Cena both making Styles tap out, it's Ambrose and Cena who are looking up at the lights at the end of it. Ambrose gets incapacitated by John Cena, but Cena takes the pinfall. Now, AJ Styles had to use a chair, but he's the heel, so it makes sense for him to do that. And it's a no disqualification match, so he's not technically cheating either, but it makes him look like a douchebag in the good way, not the Kurt Hawkins way. Cena taking a pinfall means that he gets a negative that Dean Ambrose doesn't need to take, but Dean Ambrose gets the negative of being incapacitated Although Cena gets the positive of being the person to incapacitate Dean Ambrose. So it all kind of revolves around each other. And it's this delicate structure where Cena and Ambrose and Styles all looked good coming out of this. They all looked like they were rightful champions. They all look like they have a case going forward. And they all ended up having a really, really good match. So this is big thumbs up for me. Second best thing of the night, like I mentioned. Followed up with something that wasn't really that great the Nikki Bella versus Carmella match. And I really don't have all that much to say about it. This isn't a highlight. It isn't a low point. And my next comment might be a little bit disheartening, but I'm an honest guy. I call it like I see it. And uh, (laughs) it's going to be one of those things where (laughs) you're going to hate me for saying it, but it should be said. This match was infinitely more important to both of these women than it's going to be to anybody else. I'm sure they tried their hardest to put on the best match that they could, and it was okay, it was fine, but I'm not writing home about it, you could skip it, it doesn't matter, this isn't going to be something anybody's going to talk about even tomorrow, let alone, you know, the annals of history, and, you know, Sasha Banks versus Bailey. we always bring that up. Now, this is Nikki Bella versus Carmella, it could have been a, a SmackDown match, and... Really, I mean, it's the type of thing where it's fine enough that they can continue the feud. It's not offensive in any way, but it was just a standard quality, normal feud women's match with nothing really else to go for it. Uh, There are people pointing out in our Mega Maniacs chat that there were some spot issues and some weird pacing and stuff like that. I didn't really pick up on anything too negative about it, but I don't have anything positive to say either. just was what it is. And uh, that's the end of it. They're going to have another match, I'm sure. And it's probably going to be just the same. And they're going to probably have a third match after that. It's probably going to be just the same. So I think that this is about as good as they're going to get. But they're both talented in certain ways. And um, hopefully in the future it ends up being better than this. But again, not offensively bad. Just not good. Tag Team Championship match. I thought it was fun. I do think it's the wrong call. I think that 
there's a limit to the Heath Slater and Rhino duo and what they can get out of the, the comedic element going forward. It's kind of run its course a little bit for me, and I was really hoping that the Usos would have won here because I do think that that's going to be the better call in the long run. And eventually that's going to lead to American Alpha, which is predictable if they go that route, I'll admit it. But at the same time, predictable doesn't necessarily mean bad. And I don't know if I really want to see a month building up to Survivor Series being the time that the Usos win those belts. I'd rather see that happen on SmackDown. But again, I'm going to bring up the point from earlier. I would rather see that happen at a pay-per-view than to happen on SmackDown because the pay-per-views are supposed to be more important than the SmackDown TV shows. So keeping that in mind, I do still have to say, overall, I did enjoy the match. I thought it was fun. And if you are a part of the Slater and Rhino crew that really, really wanted them to retain, you probably got a lot more entertainment out of this than you would have if they would have lost. So that's a positive for those people. If they end up having better plans in the future than the Usos, and they prove me wrong, then I'll look back on this and say, you know what, it was the right call. If they end up going with the Usos and they just wait too long to do it, and it ends up being annoying that we keep seeing uh, Slater and Rhino, then I'm going to look back to this uh, retroactively and say, you should have just pulled the trigger then. That's how it goes. Following that, we had Baron Corbin versus Jack Swagger, one of those other filler matches that was originally scheduled to be actually not a part of the card at all, and then it was at the last minute thrown together as a pre-show match, and then at the last minute after that, it was said... Nah, fuck it, we don't have that Pecky Lynch match, so let's put this on the main card. But it was pretty decent. Again, not too much to say about the matches that are just pretty decent. I liked the good use of the hand injury that was utilized to prevent Swagger from wrenching in the ankle lock. That's a good way to tell that story. I'm glad the Baron Corbin won, because he should have. I mean, Jack Swagger can't win six matches in a row or something. You gotta sort of do that back and forth. Swagger won the last one, Baron Corbin wins this one. Makes sense. I actually kind of want to see some more going forward with these two. So overall, decent enough segment, not good enough that it would have been a part of any kind of big card. And this is kind of the downside of that brand split thing is if you sort of dilute your expectations and you go with a smaller roster and the pay-per-views are smaller, then a match like Baron Corbin versus Jack Swagger is good enough to be filler for the B show. If this was still the era, that which I think was better than what we have going on now, which was Raw and SmackDown together and trying to get the best out of the most flexibility and all that, this wouldn't have been good enough. This might not have even been good enough necessarily for the pre-show. But that's the era that we're in right now, and I don't know how long it's going to continue, but that's the way you got to look at it. It's if you... Uh, break something down and then you build it up and it's good enough, then it's good enough. Isn't that kind of sad? But that's the way to look at it. Is it a positive? Yeah. Is it as good of a positive as it should be for a pay-per-view match? Not quite. But still good enough that I would like to give it a thumbs up. Baron Corbin and Jack Swagger can continue this feud, and I'm not going to be upset about that. And uh, hopefully in the end, it ends up doing wonders for both of their careers. Then we had the match, which definitely, definitely should have been the main event. And I honestly don't understand anybody's point of view if they say otherwise. Now, I understand if you say that the World Championship should have been the main event, but since it wasn't, by default, this had to be the main event. Yet, they ended up going with Randy Orton versus Bray Wyatt, and I don't understand that, but we'll get to that in a minute. But the Intercontinental Championship title versus career match, easily the best match of the night. One of the best matches of the year, as far as I'm concerned. This had everything that you can ask for in a main event. It was two talented guys going out there, telling a hell of a story, having great in-ring action, doing all of the heel tactics, which you don't really see every single one of them pulled out in a single match all that often. Miz used the turnbuckle, the exposed turnbuckle. He put his feet on the ropes. He was grabbing Ziggler's tights. He had a manager interfere with hairspray. There were two former teammates of Dolph Ziggler that tried to cause a distraction, Everything was telling the story of Dolph Ziggler being backed up into a corner and that even though he should win, he was going to lose and it was going to be the end of his career and so much was on the line and he ends up pulling out the victory in the end. It's that good feel story that made the crowd go from half of them chanting for Ziggler and half of them chanting for The Miz to everybody on their feet at the end of it. So the people that criticized The Miz for not being able to put on a good match you got to eat your words. He and Ziggler had one hell of a match tonight, which not only goes to 
the credit for The Miz, but it also goes to Dolph Ziggler, a guy that has been getting a lot of criticism lately for not being as entertaining as he used to be, and he's overrated, and all this other kind of stuff. Just goes to show, you give the two guys the platform, and you tell them to go out there and do their best, they're talented enough to be able to do it. This is fantastic, and I totally agree with Dolph Ziggler when he went on Talking Smack, and he said... Basically, what the hell? Why wasn't this the main event of the night? Just because Brandy, uh, Bray Wyatt and Randy Orton are more on the favoritism side of things, they get the main event, it doesn't make any sense because that match, in comparison, sucked. Now, it wasn't the worst thing in the world, but you mean to tell me that that was a better, more deserving match than the Intercontinental Championship one? Hell no. There's no, not even an argument for it. The best part about the Bray Wyatt and Randy Orton thing was the fact that Luke Harper returned, which is a surprise that you could have done on SmackDown, or you could have done earlier in the night, just as like some mid-event break kind of a thing. And even then, Luke Harper returning is just going back to square one. They had an opportunity here that they could have had him return and he could have cost Bray Wyatt the match, and then it would have been interesting because he would have done a babyface turn and we would have had some Harper and Wyatt feud going but he's exactly the same as he was before. So they did this whole thing with the Wyatt family. Eric Rowan, Luke Harper, and Bray Wyatt. They split up the Wyatt family, and Eric Rowan continues to wear a sheet mask for a little while, and he basically stays Eric Rowan. Luke Harper basically stays Luke Harper. And then a few months down the line, they rejoin each other. They add Braun Strowman, they split up, Eric Rowan still stays with Bray Wyatt. For some reason, Bray Wyatt is away from Braun Strowman, and Braun Strowman is able to actually do his own thing, and it's pretty entertaining. But Luke Harper is gone, yet, out of all the things to do, they bring him back as the same exact person. Now, Eric Rowan is gone for an injury, and I'm assuming at this point that they can't think of anything else to do with him either, so when he comes back, he's probably going to come back as... Sheep mask wearing Eric Rowan, and we're going to have the three Wyatt family members again. And if that's the case, why bother splitting them up? Why bother uh, doing any of this kind of stuff? If they're not good enough that they can do anything else on their own, then cut them loose if you need to. But I don't know. I was just, I really was looking forward to Luke Harper coming back on his own or as a baby face or both. Because I think that there is so much more interest to a Bray Wyatt versus Luke Harper feud than there is for Luke Harper to just be the guy who loses to Randy Orton while he's feuding with with Bray Wyatt the same way that Eric Rowan was doing. And that's probably what we're going to get over the next few weeks. It's probably going to be Naomi versus Alexa Bliss, Randy Orton versus Luke Harper, and in the same vein, we're going to get Bray Wyatt and Luke Harper versus Randy Orton and his tag team partner. And that could be Apollo Crews, it could be Jack Swagger, it could be, who knows, maybe Dean Ambrose. Or you know what, that's probably what they'll do. Here you go, it's Bray Wyatt, Luke Harper, and AJ Styles against Randy Orton, Dean Ambrose, and John Cena. That'll happen at some point. And that's the kind of predictability that kind of sucks, because Randy Orton versus Bray Wyatt just wasn't a good enough match to end the show in any kind of like really positive, uplifting sort of way, the way that the Intercontinental Championship match would have been where the world title match even would have been to an extent, because a lot of people were rooting for AJ Styles. So that ends up making the pay-per-view end on a down note, which if you start a pay-per-view with a down note and you end the pay-per-view with a down note, as much as it is that we had a great world title match and a fantastic intercontinental title match and a couple decent things throughout, it still kind of makes me go, meh, didn't really love it. Now I am going to be adding the intercontinental title match to my list of potential best matches of the year. Very, very happy that that outcome ended up being the way that it is because I didn't want Ziggler to go. Very happy that AJ Styles retained. Not a big fan of the tag team titles going that way. Not a fan at all of the SmackDown Women's Championship going down this route. And you can kind of just toss away the Nikki Bella, Carmella, and Baron Corbin, Jack Swagger things because they don't matter. And Randy Orton versus Bray Wyatt, we were supposed to get it a backlash. We didn't, which was a downside. Yet we got it here, and I don't want to see any more. I think the most interesting thing that has happened throughout this entire feud has been probably the fact that Randy Orton's face was warped on that mirror, and that's not saying a whole lot of good things. So overall, if I have to give this a thumbs up or a thumbs down, I'm in the middle. 
because I really, really wish that I could give it a thumbs up for just the two matches that were fantastic. But then I got to give it a big thumbs down for some of the parts that really sucked. So they balance out to a middle range kind of a thing. This is kind of like a um, a situation in school where you have, say, a group project. And maybe you have three people in the group. One person does a really good bang-up job, straight-A type of student. One person, they put in the effort, but they're not really too smart. So they get C's and stuff like that. And then you got this lazy asshole who didn't prepare anything ahead of time. And he ends up just dragging down the grade because he grade as a group and you can't really give idiot Billy over there uh, an A plus just because super smart Jane did all the work for him. So you end up having to give them some kind of like a C minus or a C plus to balance it out and make sure that the kid in the middle, Jimmy, we'll just call him is uh, staying around the same range and you don't reward the lazy idiot and you don't punish the uh, super great one at the top either. So that's where I can kind of balance this out to. Dolph Ziggler and The Miz, AJ Styles and Dean Ambrose and John Cena, A-plus work. Uh, situation with Nikki Bella and Carmella, Baron Corbin and Jack Swagger, the tag team title match, eh, it's about like a C-plus, B-minus, C-minus, depending on which match we're talking about. And then you go to the whole situation with the way that they handled the kickoff and the women's t uh, championship match and all that, F. So, yeah, it bounces out to a middle range kind of a thing here. I want to know what you guys have to say, though. What do you think were the highlights and the low points of this event? How do you think that they should handle this going forward? Were you as annoyed with the things that I was annoyed about? Or were you happier with certain things? Where do you stand? So drop those comments below on YouTube or the... Well, links on the comments below, whatever you're listening to this to, whether you're on eWrestling News or Smart Out Moment, or maybe you're on the iTunes or Stitcher feed, and if you are, just go to one of those pages and leave your comments. I really want to know what you guys have to think. But that'll do me in for now, which means the next time you guys will be hearing my voice is the next episode of Smack Talk, the Hot Tags of the Week. Following that is going to be the IWC Outreach of the Week. And then, I don't know, maybe that's when we're going to do our Smart Announce tables for the Hell in a Cell matches. Whatever the case may be, though, always pay attention at SmartCountMoment.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Hit that subscribe button on YouTube if you haven't already. Also, give us a thumbs up. Not enough thumbs up going around for No Mercy, so at least give them uh, some thumbs up for the No Mercy uh, pay-per-view post show. But adios for now, everybody. This has been another Smart Out Moment, and I'm being counted out. Oh!